like other days we also have series of exciting talks. So first one is um, by Professor Ranjini Bandopadhyay from Raman Research Institute, Bangalore. She will be telling us about role of controlled aging on the onset of instabilities in thin aqueous uh, clay suspension layers. Uh, thank you, Shayanton, for the introduction and uh, let me thank the organizers first for A, giving me a chance for coming here and talking and of course for, you know, continuing frack meet for so long and so well, okay. So, thank you. Okay, so I am going to tell you about two recent tabletop experiments that we performed in our laboratory. Uh, so, one of these experiments is, so both these experiments are with clay suspensions which is a colloidal material and it ages. Okay, so it shows physical aging, its properties evolve with time spontaneously for reasons I will tell you about. Uh, now the two experiments that I am going to tell you about, these are tabletop experiments. The, in the first one, we looked at viscous instabilities that form when you displace clay suspensions with Newtonian liquids. We see the most gorgeous patterns, mm, I will show you those. And then in the second part, I will tell you about desiccation cracks that form due to solvent loss from thin layers of uh, clay. So I am Ranjini from the Raman Research Institute and all the work I am going to tell you about today. Uh, the first part was done by Palak. Palak just got her PhD. She used to be my PhD student till last year. She is now in Canada. And this is Vaibhav. He's done the second part of the talk. He also had a supporting role in the first part. Uh, He's about to finish his thesis. Okay, so clays are ubiquitous, right? I mean, they're all around us. You know, it's the it's in the ground beneath our feet. It has several several uses. Like it's used for sculpting, pottery. It has industrial uses. It's an insulator. Uh, it has medical uses. Kaolinite K, for instance, is used as an anti-diarrheal, uh, and we use it for research because it is a fantastic model system for a soft, glossy material. Now, have you ever wondered what clay looks like? So, we just put some clay under the microscope. It's a length scale we were trying to measure, but really, we, we, we wanted to view over really, really small. This is what it looks like. So, it forms a gel kind of a structure, and I'll tell you why it forms a gel. But then it's a very fragile network that it forms, and each strand of this gel that you see here, it is constituted by many, many clay particles. So, there you go. Uh, within a certain concentration regime, clay forms a gel and it is that concentra concentration range that we'll be looking at. So, it forms these gel-like structures that are weak and are held together by screen electrostatic interactions. So, you know, you can think of particles with a, with a kind of a Debye layer around it and, you know, there's screen charges and there are some charge distributions that I'll tell you about that gives rise to this kind of a network gel structure. The two main properties that we will uh, exploit in both the studies that I'm going to tell you about are the fragility of the clay. It's a soft suspension. It can be broken up very easily. You just need to take some clay. Looks elastic. You just need to take a spoon or a fork. If you stir it, you're going to completely melt the clay. Okay, and aging. So here we are talking about physical aging. Uh, the structures, the microstructures in clay they evolve with time spontaneously and I'll tell you why they do so. First, let's look what an individual clay particle looks like. So, clay particles have sheet-like structures. This is a single uh, inorganic molecule of clay and they are ma more, mainly made of uh, aluminum silicates. So, on the top layer here, you see some oxygen ions and there are also some sodium ions. So, the moment you put a, take a, this molecule and put it in water, the sodium ions are going to diffuse out into the water and form an electrical double layer, right? So you can think of the clay, this is a, it's a, it has a disc-like structure. So if, it, if this is a clay plate, then the faces, they are positive, they are, uh, they are negatively charged because of the oxygen ions and the whole clay particle is surrounded by this DLVO layer, the Debye layer of uh, positively charged sodium ions. And depending on the pH of the medium, there are these side groups that are magnesium. They get hydrated. So you end up with a disc that has, so it's a plate, okay? The faces are negative and the sides are, the rim of the disc is positive. Uh, okay, so uh, why does clay age? Okay, so when you, we buy uh, clay off the shelf, okay, from say, you know, Sigma or Rich in the best case, and we buy it as a powder. 
and this is what it looks like. Now, when you put this powder in water, the clay, you know, the clay granules here, they basically they dissociate into these uh, particle stacks. Okay, so these are one-dimensional aggregates. Okay, so they like think of them as vertical ag aggregates. They're called uh, tactoids, and so this is what an individual stack looks like. But what this picture doesn't tell you is that, you know, these these golden uh, discs that you see, these are the clay particles. But in the intergallery layer between the two clay particles, you have sodium ions, right, that come from here. Now, the moment you put this uh, stack into water, there's an osmotic pressure difference. As a result of this, the sodium ions in the interlayer gallery, they try to come out into the bulk. And as a result, the clay swells. Okay, so the clay swells. And like I told you, each clay particle has this double layer repulsive uh, layer around it. Now, the moment, you know, because of the swelling of the clay, when the double layer repulsion exceeds the interparticle van der Waals interaction, the clay particles, they start peeling off from the edges. Okay, so this is called exfoliation. And this is why the aging happens, because, you know, there's this constant, this evolution of the microscopic structure of the clay. There are these particles, you know, these tactoids that are swelling, particles that are falling off. Now, remember, each particle, like I told you, it has this anisotropic distribution of charges. The plates are... Uh, the, so it, it's a disc like this, okay, with the faces that are negatively charged and the, the rim, which is positively charged, which depends on pH. But then in the experiments that I'll be telling you about, this is exactly what they look like, okay? Uh, these things can be controlled. So it's a fantastic, fantastic test bed to do all kinds of experiments. Now, because, so these are the clay particles. Now, because of their negative faces and the positive rims, they can form these house of cards kind of structures, Okay. Uh, so it's saying, you know, it can form a percolating network in your entire sample. So that's what we are calling a gel here. And indeed, these are measurements that we did. So if you take a freshly made clay suspension, you know, and you just start measuring the sodium ion concentrations with TW, which is the age of the sample, that's the time since preparation. So you just make the sample stir it vigorously, then just let it age. Okay, so the time at which the stirring has stopped, that is what? is TW is equal to zero, which is the aging time or the waiting time. And then you just measure the, you don't disturb the sample, or at least you disturb it minimally. As you're making the measurement, use a sodium ion sensor. And this is an experiment that has gone on for 28 hours. You can see that the sodium ions are gradually diffusing out into the suspension. And that's what we are measuring. This is from a paper quite long ago. Now, this is what a sample looks like. So when you make a freshly when you freshly prepare a clay suspension, okay, so you just put the clay in water, you mix it, and then it's it looks like, so you can see the meniscus here, right? So it's liquid. It's a liquid. It's a liquid that's about 10 times more viscous than water. But then you seal it up, come back the next day after 24 hours, turn it over, it's become a solid. Okay, it's become a soft, glassy material. It's a, so what you just did here was, a viscoelastic liquid to a viscoelastic solid transition. Now, the beauty is that it happens spontaneously because of the evolution of the microstructures that I told you about. Okay, and sure enough, this is some rheology that we did. So here G prime are these solid uh, circles. This is the elastic modulus. G double prime are these uh, hollow symbols that, that is the viscous modulus. So when you just apply a very, very small oscillation, just enough to measure the elastic and viscous moduli of this material versus the time of waiting or the aging time, you can see that initially at very low aging times, that is just after you have loaded the sample into the rheometer, your system is a liquid, right? You can see that the hollow symbols are above the solid symbols. But then if you just wait, again, you are not disturbing your sample. You wait for about an hour or so, and you can see that the elastic modulus, it exceeds the viscous modulus. So that's where you just, you know, that's where the viscoelastic liquid to the solid transition just happened. And if you go further down in time, which is what we'll mostly be doing, you can see that this is a solid, okay? So this is very, very elastic. It's much, much more elastic than it is viscous. Okay, and so just to again explain what is happening, so at the very low aging times, uh, you can think of them as particles or stacks that are completely, you know, they're not touching, 
okay they are kind of diffusing around and therefore it you know what you really see is the liquid like character but then as you wait you've allowed the sample a lot of time so that its microscopic structures build up so that the gel structure builds up you end up with a house of cards structure that is of course it's a rigid structure as a result of which your system is now elastic uh, okay, and this is from another different uh, work that we did. Aging, of course, is very interesting in the material, but this is viscoelastic. It's a shear thinning viscoelastic material. So here we have the same laponite suspensions, but then aged to different times. So you just fill it in the rheometer, wait for one, two, and three hours, and then shear it in rotational rheometry measurements, and you can see that the viscosity decreases with shear rate. So it's shear thinning. So it has, so laponite, or, you know, in this case we are using laponite as a model clay. This would work for any other clay uh, particle. Okay, it could work for synthetic clays or natural clays, but these are the two properties that we are going to exploit today. One is its time dependent rheology, its aging, and the other is its shear thinning rheology, its shear dependent rheology. And let's see if we can actually control the kind of patterns that we make in our interfacial instabilities experiments and let us see if we can control the cracking of clay. Okay, so yeah. So this is our first experiment. Uh, so the displacement of clay suspensions by Newtonian fluids, okay, in a Healy Shaw geometry. And the, like I just told you, we want to see if we can exploit the unique rheology of clay to control the growth of the interface. So this is our experiment. Uh, these, uh, these sky blue plates are big, okay, they are about 30 centimeters in radius. And uh, each glass plate has a thickness of about a centimeter. And the two glass plates have a tiny, tiny separation that we, uh, the, the separation is because of some spacers of 170 microns that we put in between to give us a little tiny gap that we could call quasi two dimensional. Okay, and then the top plate has a little hole so that our syringe pump can fit to it and it can inject different kinds of fluids. So the first fluid that we fill here is the clay. Okay, so we take a freshly prepared clay suspension and we first inject it through the syringe pump. We wait for it to evolve because, you know, as I told you, clay microstructures evolve. So we waited, so in every ex experiment, we've used a different clay sample. We waited for it to evolve for different times. So we wait for the clay suspension to evolve different kinds, different uh, quanta of elasticity. Okay, so each system is elastic, but you know, it's different. You know, the viscoelastic properties are a little different. So we just let the clay suspension settle and evolve and then we uh, inject the second fluid which for simplicity in this case, I mean this is hard enough, okay, but then uh, we have in the second fluid which is the red fluid that you see here, this is a a Newtonian fluid. Now, you know, it is Newtonian, but it can have different kinds of wettabilities. So uh, the clay suspension of course is made in water. Okay, so it, it is an aqueous suspension. So we've used two kinds of, uh, uh, we've looked at two kinds of interfaces here. One is a miscible interface, in which case we have used our syringe pump to inject water. In the second case, we've injected oil so that, you know, I mean, there's surface tension at the interface. Okay, so we have the zero interfacial tension and the non-zero interfacial tension case. And then we are experimentalists. We measure things, you know, by looking at them. So that we, we, uh, we illuminate the sample from the top and then we image it from the bottom using a high-speed camera. Okay, so just to, again, you know, motivate the problem, I'll just tell you that the outer purple fluid here, that's clay, which is aging and it is shear thinning. Okay, it's non-Newtonian and the displacing fluid that we've used is water and mineral oil and I think if I have done it right in the rest of this part of the talk, water will be in blue and mineral oil which is our immiscible solvent, okay, or the immiscible displacing fluid will be in red and as you can see, so this is the viscosity of both these materials versus a shear rate and there you go, so water is black here already but then this is oil but then you can see that unlike in the case of the non-Newtonian fluid, these two materials, the displacing fluid, so that's the red material here, it does, the viscosity does not depend on the shear rate that you've applied. So these are our miscible displacement patterns. So the gray uh, thing that you see here, this gray, uh, this is the clay, you're looking at it from the bottom, okay, and you are, and so this is where I'm going to be uh, introducing my 
uh, water which I have dyed red so that you can see the interface. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. So, and now this is what we've done. So, these, this is what all the three boxes are about. So, in the first case, we filled the clay, we waited for an hour. So, it's not very elastic, okay. Maybe structures have started developing, but it's really more viscous than it is elastic. In the second system, so these are all separate experiments. We again, we introduce the clay, we wait for three hours. Okay, so now the structures have started building up, though they are not very dense yet. So this is elastic, but you know, there's also a, vis uh, the, a viscous uh, component that is uh, uh, quite significant, but after 24 years, uh, uh, 24 hours, it's like, a, it's, it's like our window glass, okay, it's a solid. Hmm? So each are, like I said, I can't reiterate this enough, you know, these are systems with memory, they are aging. So each of these are fresh samples. So my students actually will, you know, inject the sample, wait for 24 hours, come back the next day. And of course, we do things like sticking nail polish on the side so that, you know, the aqueous solvent does not uh, evaporate. And then we do the experiment. So let's look at the experiment at one hour. So this is when the uh, laponite clay is quite viscous, okay? But then the viscosity of the laponite clay, it is still less, it, it is still more than the viscosity of the, uh, the fluid, the water that is being injected into the laponite, you get a viscous instability. But you can see this is a kind of an odd kind of a pattern. Uh, you know, it, it, if you look at it very carefully, you'll see that much of the propagation is happening because of tip splitting, though there are a few side branches, okay? There are really no clearly well-defined boundaries. And if you look close enough again, you're going to see that the fingers actually even start merging into each other, okay? So this is a pattern that we call a dense viscous pattern. And then let's look what happens when we waited a little bit longer, when the clay suspension was a little more elastic than it was in the first place. Okay, so I don't know if you're noticing it, but you can see that the propagation is already becoming faster and you get these beautiful patterns that have no tip splitting at all, but you have side branching. Okay, so why does side branching happen? Because the fluid outside is viscoelastic and as you're driving in the water at rather high driving pressures, Okay, there is a competition that goes on. On the one hand, the tip of every finger is trying to shear thin the clay suspension, okay, that it is invading. And on the other hand, there's this driving pressure of water that is trying to broaden the fingers. And that results in the, uh, the shedding of side branches. And as you can see, so this is the first, you know, so you wait for a little bit of time and you can see that the elastic effects are kind of becoming more and more prominent. Now let's look at our, yeah. Yes. You wouldn't see anything moving. Yeah. So see, this is like, you know, you could do this with your naked eyes. Okay. I mean, we're just looking at the interface. You know, we're looking at the morphology of the fully developed pattern here. Though we've done a lot more than that, we've even, you know, kind of tracked individual fingers, but I'll not have time to tell you about that. Yeah. So here it's really the, you know, so we're really looking at length scales that are this big. Okay. Yeah. So we call these dendritic patterns, though they may not exactly be dendrites, but then the reason why we are calling them dendrites is because of the predominance of the formation of uh, side branches. And uh, here's the cracking, which you saw a lot of. Okay. So here, remember, so this is a very aged suspension. It's very elastic. So when you are driving the water through the suspension, you know, the elastic stresses that are being built up, they have to be released and they have to be released really, really fast. Okay. So this happens by the evolution, you know, by the formation of these crack patterns. And as you can see, there are a few primary branches. They are all very narrow. Okay, they are really, really narrow. They are narrower than all the other uh, branches that we formed here. And there are some stresses that are also being released perpendicularly. So you have these perpendicular offshoots that are very, very typical of crack patterns. But there's one thing that I cannot stress enough here. Just remember that, you know, we've got this kind of zoo of patterns and I'll show you more when we change the miscibility at the interface using it's the same suspension, okay? It's chemically the same suspension, it's just doing its own thing, we've just waited. So the only control parameter here is just waiting for different amounts of time. What we have in that gray thing, okay, it is the, ident it's the chemically identical sample. 
this is a viscoelastic fracture okay and now of course we've done it at many many other different ages and you can see that as the age of the suspension increases and as you inject water you can see that you have this kind of a smooth transition from this kind of a dense viscous pattern through the dendritic kind of pattern and then all the way up to uh, viscoelastic fractures uh, okay so that was a miscible displacement case what happens if you if there is some surface tension at the interface. So what we do here is instead, so this is the same clay that we have. Uh, so here this is clay at, uh, that has been aged only up to an hour and this is clay that has been aged up to 24 hours and we inject oil. Okay, It is a mineral oil, it looks red because we have dyed it with uh, Nile red and then let us see what happens. Uh, it is at the, these experiments are at the exact same flow rate as I used in the miscible displacement case. Okay, initially nothing. Okay, it, this is almost like a viscous viscous displacement. Okay, so you have this interface that a stable interface that grows, and now you can see that you know there are some tiny tiny protrusions that are beginning to develop. Okay, so after that initial stable growth, you see some well some fat protrusions that develop we call this the flower pattern and one thing you would notice is it's taking forever to propagate okay that is because of this the stabilizing effect of surface tension okay so we call this the flower pattern again it's the same you know clay as before all we've done is we've changed the miscibility of the two fluids at the interface and then you wait much longer and then again you introduce oil in a fresh sample you can see the it, it changes okay so that is because you know at 24 hours of age the clay has many many elastic structures right so as the as the oil propagates through these elastic structures it has to break up these structures okay so lots of elastic stresses are being released there's a huge energy cost and that is the reason why you find these ramified structures okay they're still trying to kind of you know smoothen out because that's what surface tension does but you still have this kind of a branching pattern where every finger is much thicker than you saw in the case of the miscible uh, displacement pattern and I will just tell you so we call this jack patterns I mean this is not something that you know we came up with but this is something that was seen by Doug Durian and group when they actually they invaded foam shaving foam with air okay so that was also an immiscible displacement shaving foam is very very elastic and they saw the same kind of pattern. Okay, and again, even for these, I am sorry about that displacement spelling. So, even for the immiscible displacement uh, experiments, we have done it at several different ages. So, this is with age, uh, sample age, uh, the clay age uh, increasing, and you can see you first, you know, for the younger samples, you see that you have the stable interface that. Uh, eventually develops this uh, you know flowery petal like pattern at the interface and then you move on to the jagged patterns that I just showed you about. So what to do with these patterns right. So let us see so we have used the same clay we have just waited for different amounts of time. Uh, we have also changed the flow rates of the, dri the driving pressures of the Newtonian fluids as you will see okay and we have got this zoo of patterns. So let us try to uh, kind of put some numbers to the pattern. So what we have done here is we have defined a quantity called an aerial ratio which is the AP here is the area that is covered by the fully developed pattern. Okay, So once the pattern is not really developing anymore that is our T is equal to the end of the experiment and that the area that the pattern covers the that the fully developed morphology covers we call it AP and we divided it by the radius by the area of the circle of the minimum the smallest circle okay that can uh, kind of uh, enclose the entire uh, uh, the, the pattern that we see. Okay, and of course, there are the usual things to calculate, which is the finger frequency. So these are the number of frequencies within an annulus, okay, uh, at the, the edge of the pattern, and of course, the finger width, which is the width of the individual fingers. And then we here is all our data here. Okay, so this is all our surface tension zero data. So these are the uh, experiments. These are just snapshots from the experiments. This is the fully developed pattern morphology when uh, the age of the clay suspension goes up and when the clay suspension is being invaded by water and you can see how the 
coverage changes, right? I mean, you don't really need to put a number to it. I mean, you just need to look at these pictures. And then here again, the clay suspension age is increasing, but then you've introduced this immiscibility at the interface, and here are our patterns. And then, and here are the numbers that we've calculated. So you can see that the finger widths don't really change in the two cases, in, um, apart from the fact that, you know, in the miscible displacement cases, uh, the fingers are way, way narrower, okay? And uh, the, in the case of the uh, immiscible displacement uh, experiments, you can see that the, the uh, finger frequency doesn't change very much either, as you can see here. That's because, again, like I said, that's the stabilizing effect of surface tension. But when you use the miscible, when you did the miscible displacement, you can see that the finger frequency decreases very, very rapidly as you age the sample. Okay, yeah. Uh, some cases it is clear uh, what is small r, but uh, in this case, in your leftmost picture, no, uh, this one, the bigger one. This one. Uh, so how are you defining small r? I mean. Uh, I mean, there is no small r here. Ah, okay. okay. <laughs> sorry, I, that was a different analysis. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So all we do is we count the pixels of the, you know, the pattern. And then, you know, we just, we just have a big R here. I'm sorry, that is from some other talk. Oh. Okay. Okay, so that was when we were looking at the growth of the longest finger, which I'm not really going to tell you about here. Yeah. So, yeah. So then, you know, and as you can see here, so again, reds are oil and blacks are uh, the water displacement experiments. And you can see that, you know, you get much more uh, compact patterns when you use oil rather than, you know, water. And then now there's something else that you can do. So you see the zoo of patterns because you're really, as the Newtonian fluid invades the outer suspension, it's really changing the rheology of the suspension, right? Because here you have, you're displacing a suspension that is aging. You can also change the rheology because, you know, the rheology is dependent on the shear rate, right? So what we do here is we again change the rheology of the clay suspension by changing the shear rate of the water or the oil that is invading the clay suspension okay so that's our data so this is with flow rate increasing so here all the clay we for all these uh, experiments we waited for 24 hours okay for the clay to become elastic to settle down okay and then we inject water here and oil here but at increasing flow rates just to increase the shear rate and you can see what we get here is exactly you know it's the inverse of what we got when we aged the sample okay so as you increase the flow rate you can see that you know because this was a highly aged sample you started off with a viscoelastic fracture then eventually you moved on to a dendritic pattern we didn't quite see dense viscous but then you know these are things that one can do by just changing the age of the clay suspension with which we started now similarly for oil because you know the clay outside was highly aged when we introduced the oil at a very low flow rate you get the jagged pattern but as you increase the flow rate more and more you can see that because of shear thinning of the outer clay suspension the viscosity mismatch between the oil and the the water they kind of that that mismatch reduces as a result of which, for a very long time, you can actually stabilize the interface before you see these little protrusions coming out in the form of a flower pattern. So again, we've done the same kind of uh, uh, analysis. And again, we see that, you know, the finger, you know, because you have the really the same uh, uh, patterns here, only in the opposite direction. Before, we were really plotting these quantities versus the age of the clay suspension that we were displacing. Here, we have uh, plotted it versus the, uh, the, the volumetric flow rate of the... Um, of the Newtonian fluid that is, uh, that is displacing the clay suspension, okay? So now, okay, so we have lots of patterns. Can we somehow, you know, is there anything that we can predict? Can we control these patterns? I mean, clearly we can, right? We control the pattern just by controlling the rheology of the outer face as well as the flow rate of the, uh, of the uh, Newtonian fluid, the second, the displacing fluid. And then, so here we've plotted this aerial ratio versus the finger, the product of the finger width and the finger frequency. And sure enough, regardless of, you know, what the flow rate of the displacing fluid is, what the rheology of the outer fluid is, or, you know, whether you are using a miscible displacement, whether your experiments are a miscible displacement experiment or an immiscible displacement uh, experiment, you see that these two quantities are linearly correlated. 
okay? And then this was, you know, we had to kind of end this thing somehow. So we thought, why not let's make this three-dimensional phase diagram where the, yeah, perhaps, you know, I mean, as you can see, the all the quantities at the, the larger F into Ws are really oil, right? So there will be small changes. But then what we are trying to say is that this area can be kind of, you know, described by this product. I mean, you know, because these are the two length scales that we can really find. But, you know, as you know, for the oil, so initially there was no finger, right? Because it was just a stable displacement. So, I mean, all this is very, very approximate. So, I mean, the message really here is that, you know, you're using the same suspension, okay, but you can control the morphology of the patterns just by, you know, waiting for longer and longer times. So then, yeah, we managed to kind of segregate this pattern. Uh, uh, segregate all the patterns in a kind of a phase diagram where, you know, and we did this in terms of the logarithm of the aerial ratio. So if you probably give me the logarithm of an aerial ratio, I can tell you that, okay, if this is the laponau, if this is the clay outside and if this is the material that you are injecting into it, this is the pattern that you get even without seeing the pattern. Okay, and I just told you about the fully developed morphology. So we also really looked at the temporal growth of the patterns. I'm not going to have time to tell you this, but then obviously the temporal growth of the patterns do determine their fully developed morphologies. Uh, and like I told you, in the case of the dense viscous pattern, we see a lot of tip splitting as the age increases, as the laponite, the clay age increases and you get, uh, you know, the clay becomes a little more elastic. You see a lot of side branching and then eventually cracking. And when you have an immiscible displacement, you start off with a stable interface, you form these protrusions and then you get this kind of a ramified jagged pattern. Okay, so we've really looked at these by looking at the propagation of the longest finger and then we have this other very colorful figure where again, you know, just by looking at the velocity of propagation, okay, you can kind of segregate all the patterns. Now, you know, like Vani pointed out, you know, this is not really much, but the, this is the message of the whole thing. I'm showing you this because these patterns are so gorgeous, you know, I could just look at them all day. Very difficult to really, you know, do a simulation and understand them, but, you know, I just uh, thought, you know, this is a meeting on cracks and upscaling and I could say that, you know, I can predict the patterns that will happen if I know the rheology outside. This is an obvious statement, but here I'm controlling the rheology outside. Okay, so the aerial ratio and the pattern propagation velocity are both very sensitively dependent on the rheology of the outer viscoelastic clay suspension and of course it depends on the, you know, wettability of the two fluids and the injection flow rate of the displacing fluid. The suspension age used here, we are really using the suspension age, we believe for the first time as a control parameter to study the growth of unstable interfaces and to control the growth and for the, you know, onset and and growth of the unstable interfaces. And these are some of the uh, papers that we wrote based on this. Okay. So, I'm going to take a little break here because, you know, I'm going to now move on to something related, but, you know, it's a different set of experiments. So, patterns in nature, of course, are ubiquitous. Okay, you have the tree that branches, you know, this is the branching morphogenesis in the, in a vertebrate airway tract and, you know, why do we have branches, you know, because it is optimizing some function. It could be a different function, but branching optimizes this function and then, of course, I told you another beautiful pattern that occurs. But those were, you know, what we saw in the lab. This is from the seminal paper by Safman and Taylor. So, here you see tongues of air that are invading glycerol. Okay, so patterns are beautiful for an experimentalist, you know, there's another kind of pattern, okay, and these are desiccation cracks, uh, okay, cracking of soil, okay, clay of course is a major ingredient of soil, so there are some, you know, model soils that we made in the lab and we tried to uh, do some experiments with, so why do cracks form? I mean, we have the experts sitting right here, but then so you can, you know, here we are really thinking of, you know, clay as these uh, in this cartoon, it's a spherical, you know, these are like circular, uh, you know, they look circular here. There is this water phase, okay, so you can think, and in our case, of course, you have a clay gel, so the particles are touching, okay, but then you have water in the pores of this gel. Right, and then as evaporation happens, okay, you have a capillary uh, contribution that develops. Okay, there's a vertical consolidation of the material. The sample becomes thinner. Okay, you have this meniscus that forms. The pore pressure goes up because remember we are talking about really, really tiny pores here. 
okay these are like maximum micron sized pores so that's 1 over r so the pressures are huge okay you could have cap capillary uh, suction but in any case you know there are tensile stresses that develop in the the you know the, the plane the top plane and then you get surface cracks that form and this is a picture that I got from here. So now let us see if we can control crack formation in these clays. Okay? So like I told you when you just make a clay, uh, it is a viscoelastic liquid, you let it evaporate, you know there is solvent loss so obviously you know the concentration increases, you end up with a viscoelastic solid, you evaporate it a bit more and then it starts cracking, I will show you a video in a little while in a little bit actually uh, and then there is another way in which you can go from a clay suspension being a viscoelastic liquid to a viscoelastic solid and that is just by controlling the physical aging which is what we do in this system. So not only do we have solvent loss as we do in a usual uh, desiccation experiment here we are also controlling the physical aging of the clay suspension that is cracking and just to remind you at very low ages of the clay suspension you can think of these clay the charged clay particles as all being you know individually they are diffusing around in the water medium but at higher age they form these house of card structures which is a rigid structure it's a gel like structure and therefore your sample behaves like an elastic solid but it's a soft solid which means that you know it's it's fragile and you can very easily it yields very easily okay and how have we changed the aging behavior of the clays it's very simple we've changed the interparticle interactions and because these are you know charge stabilized colloids it's very easy to change the interparticle interactions and you can completely stop the aging process okay so when this happens you know you've reached what is called a state of kinetic arrest now you can just add a little bit of a sample that i'll tell you about and you can completely melt that kinetically arrested phase so and that element that that compound is TSPP. So we use a tiny amount of tetrasodium pyrophosphate as an additive okay and what happens then is when you add it to your clay suspension the P2O7s the pyrophosphates they go sit on the positively charged rims. The positively charged rims now become negatively charged okay and that completely fluidizes your system over the range you know over the experimental time scale and of course there was the second experiment where we did not use any additive at all okay so you got the usual clay gel and in the third experiment we put common salt and remember I told you these clay particles they have a Debye layer around them so when you add the salt what do you do you are basically shrinking the the, the, the Debye layer so then the particles they can now attract okay because of the negatively uh, negatively charged faces and the positively charged rims you form uh, you form gels that are denser than you would have formed had there been no common salt at all okay so these are the three kinds of you know samples we've made so you can think of them as going from repulsive particles all the way to highly highly attractive particles as you uh, add salt okay and sure enough yes Uh, you could, uh, uh, couldn't, it is also pH dependent uh, across the isoelectric point. They uh, we are way away from the isoelectric so point. You are, uh, no, so we are not worried pH, about that at all. Yeah. You, so, I mean, in all our experiments, you know, so we are really at, you know, pHs of 7 or so. So, whatever you do, uh, your pH is never at the isoelectric point Lapolite of 11. Lapolite in water would be around 10 generally. Uh, right. How did you get 7? you can put a bit of you know acid and stuff like right. that yeah, okay. All yeah. Right. because we wanted to stay for, you know because we understand that we are adding you know we are put uh, in incorporating additives and stuff so we wanted to make sure that we are away from that isoelectric point right. thanks so this is the rheology uh, data right here. So here this is the data that you get. So this is the complex viscosity which we get from oscillatory rheology experiments versus the aging time of the clay. And as you can see here we have continued up to 300 minutes and for the sample in TS, with TSPP which was this repulsive sample, the non gel forming sample, you can see that the viscosity does not change. It is actually a little more viscous than the viscosity of water. Okay, it's about 10 millipascal seconds. But then, when you didn't have an additive, okay, which is here, you can see that initially not much happened. So you had a viscoelastic liquid, like I told you earlier. Uh, when you make when you mix clay with water, you end up, you know, you you first make something that's about 10 times more viscous than water, and then it starts aging. So that's what you see here. But when you added the salt, it's a solid from the beginning. 
okay. So when you added the salt, you know immediately you had these debye layers that started collapsing, the particles came together, formed these aggregates, formed the gel and we started measuring this, you know, as you can see from 0.2 minutes, okay, it's already, it's a solid, okay. So now let's see how these crack and because, you know, we know that it's really the elastic samples that are going to crack within, you know, a time scale that's reasonable. So all the experiments that I'll show you about after, that I'll show you after this are done with the sample with different amounts of salt, okay. So this is the experiment that we've done. We wanted to look at the onset of the crack, cracking process and uh, this is the, you know, we made a box in the lab. Okay, this is the sample. The sample is put on a transparent weighing scale. Okay, we can control the temperature and the relative humidity. The relative humidity is controlled by a saturated salt solution. So in all these experiments, the relative humidity is maintained at 27 uh, percent. Um, there's a heating element, you know, and everything, the, the temperature is controlled using a, you know, a, an Arduino controlled uh, relay. Okay, and then we have, a, we have illumination here, so we can we can uh, look at the cracks, we have a digital camera, okay, so we can image the cracks. So this is a high speed uh, camera, though you know the, this, ex these experiments that we've done, for the, all the solvent to evaporate, it takes almost 24 hours, okay. So and, 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 and you know this, the onset of the crack that we've seen, so we really look at the sample as it's drying, we look at that instant at which the substrate gets exposed, okay, because of cracking and that is our crack onset time and we compare that crack onset time with micro indentation measurements that we've made in, a, in, a, in an AFM to look at the elasticity of the sample layer. It's a partially dried sample. So uh, here's what you do, you take the sample, stick it into an AFM, okay, so there are these desiccation cracks that are forming and when we tried doing an AFM experiment with just this sample, the capillary attractions were so high we thought our AFM would break. So we put a little layer of oil, okay, and then we made the measurements. So this you can see is the cantilever and the AFM tip and this is now uh, the magnified image you can see. So here's our, uh, it's a pyramidal tip, it's a silicon uh, tip and then you know this, this spherical thing that you have here, we think that's what the oil does, you know, it goes, you know, because of surface tension, sits like that around the tip and then we do this in the contact mode, it's a micro indentation measurement, so we go deeper and deeper and deeper and we, we find, we measure the force versus indentation uh, curve uh, for, you know, different clay suspensions, different ages, different uh, salt concentrations and so on. And now, uh, so this is a 24 hour video, so nothing happens in the first 9 hours. So this is our Petri dish with the clay suspension image from the top, nothing happens initially, okay and then so we start the video at 9 hours and we will I think finish it in 9 seconds or so, so that will be like you know 15 hours of experiment, okay. So you see, I don't know, I mean this might have been a bit fast but initially it shrinks from the sides. From, from the edges, okay, of the Petri dish and after that, you know, you have these cracks that propagate tangentially, you know, to the boundary and then, you know, you also have a few radial cracks that form. So, uh, okay, so then, uh, so here are our cracks, okay, so these are snapshots from the same uh, image and uh, like I told you, our cracking sample, this was on a, uh, on a weighing balance, right, so, you know, we could actually take the weight all the time right and then this is what we see so the weight versus elapsed time so as you can see this goes on for a long long time so this blue curve is the weight versus time you can see there is so and this is the evaporation rate that we've calculated so there is a constant evaporation rate zone before which you know capillary pressures become huge and you know everything happens together and very fast but then all our data including the uh, formation of the first crack happens here at the constant evaporation uh, rate regime Okay, yeah, and then this is really not terribly uh, relevant anymore, but I'll just show you some experiments because Vaibhav did these, you know, so he used uh, a digital image correlation technique. So this, these are again the kind of the processed images of the Petri dishes seen from the top. So what he did was he took the Petri dishes with the clay as it was uh, cracking, he put some pepper powder on it and that was, the, he did a kind of a particle imaging velocimetry and then he calculated the strain fields by looking at successive images, okay. 
okay so this was done with a code that you know we could find uh, encore okay it's a matlab code that is freely available in the internet and these are the three sets of experiments in this case the number a this is what i've been telling you about you know you have the petri dish and you have clay and you just let it dry over here what vibhav has done is he's just coated the the rims of the petri dish okay so there is really no addition with the walls and you can see already that even though there is a crack that forms much much later there is hardly any cracking in the system when you just coat the rims with a little bit of grease okay so but what happens is you know the sample shrinks okay so because there is uh, no uh, right so so it just uh, it it shrinks it doesn't crack now in this case the third case he coated the whole petri dish with uh, uh, grease and as you can see there's even after 20 30 hours practically there is absolutely no uh, cracking at all there's only shrinking okay it just detaches from the wall and shrinks yeah ah okay i think i'm almost done i think yeah so so the 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 cracks will only form if the sample adheres to the boundary i mean this is kind of obvious but then you know this is so cool that i thought i'll show you and then so this is the data that we have here so this is temporal data okay so this is the same sample you are just letting it evolve these are snapshots from the drying process and as you go from top to bottom you are increasing the elasticity of the suspension because you know this this row this is with samples of the tspp which is very very liquidy this is with you know no additive at all this row so therefore you know it is kind of a viscoelastic liquid that is uh, uh, evolving into a weak viscoelastic solid and this is the sample with salt so you know this is highly highly elastic pretty much from the beginning and it cracks a lot okay and you can see the different uh, how different the patterns are right so as you become more and more elastic the cracking is uh, you know it's it's a lot more it's you know you have more cracks you know it happens faster and so on and so forth so now we calculate the crack onset time i told you how we do it we look at we define the crack onset time as the time at which the first uh, the substrate can first be seen i'm not showing you the raw data but then as you can see as you increase the sodium chloride concentration crack onset time goes down quite a bit now here we have a narrow range so the cl here is the concentration of the clays that we used as you can see that the range is rather narrow which is why you know i'm not going to make a song and dance about any kind of uh, you know trend in that narrow regime and the reason why we use this particular uh, range of clay concentrations is because this is where clay forms a soft glass if you add any more clay you're going to get into a nematic phase okay which we wanted to avoid because we want to eventually use the poroelastic model for that we want a gel okay now these are the final dried patterns again as you go up here on the y axis your clay concentration is increasing that means your elasticity goes up and here we are increasing this you know additive concentration so again you are going from tspp high quantities of tspp uh, through zero uh, additive to high concentrations of sodium chloride so you also are increasing elasticity as you proceed in this direction so as you go to positive x or positive y you are increasing the elasticity of the drying sample and sure enough for the highest elasticities you see the maximum cracking you also see that the cracking happens the earliest okay uh, and here's the surface crack ratio and again you can see that you know it's just what i told you that as you increase the salt concentration you can see that cracking happens much earlier okay so initially of course you'll see i mean there's really no cracking okay when you are using tspp so these points here are really uh, we are really looking at the surf the substrate being exposed not because of cracking but because of lateral shrinkage okay from the boundaries uh, without the formation of uh, cracks okay so here's our result from the micro indentation measurements so this is the force indentation depth uh, plots that we have for different you know the same clay concentration but with different uh, sodium chloride uh, common salt concentrations this is just representative data we've taken hundreds of data points here okay and as you can see probably because of that spherical approximation of the tip that we made it does fit to an to a hertzian model and it lets us uh, measure this you know it lets us estimate the young's modulus which we've plotted here 
okay and as you can see that as you increase the concentration of clay so as you increase the elasticity uh, the the elasticity that as you increase the age of the su suspension the measured elasticity in the micro indentation experiments do increase and as you increase the salt con content in the sample again the measured elasticity increases and uh, okay so this is just representative data at two different elapsed times since the you know the the material was loaded into the petri dish and so this is for 14 hours this is for 11 hours and again this is just to show that you know the data at 14 hours shows you larger if you can call this a film i don't know i like calling it a layer because it's not really a film in that sense it's a little thicker than that so for the data at 14 hours when there's been more solvent loss and there's been more aging you can see that the elasticity evolves much much faster okay as you change the concentration and then you know in the case of the uh, younger sample okay and then we have done this you know this is all very uh, half baked yet but then we used a poroelastic model you heard a you know you heard a talk on poroelasticity yesterday and i think there was one or two that i missed earlier so you know so we used a poroelastic model we use a boundary condition which is the darcy's law to give us the gradient of liquid pressure at the upper surface of the gel and using that you can calculate the stress the in plane stress at the upper surface which is basically it goes as the elasticity of the sample the the time okay uh, at which you are measuring this elasticity the volumetric uh, uh, the the evaporation rate and the the height of the sample which in this case was about uh, 7 millimeters and then in that we incorporated the griffiths criterion for the formation of uh, new surfaces because of crack and you have to believe the algebra here i Sayantan is asking me to hurry up but eventually tc is the time okay at which sigma is equal to sigma c that is the onset stress at which cracks start to form which gives us a tc which is the crack onset time which we just measured uh, in our imaging experiments and we see that that goes as one over root of the elasticity so tc is something that we measured from our visualization experiments this capital e is something that we measured from our uh, indentation experiments so we plotted these okay so here tc is uh, plotted over one over plotted against 1 over root over e and well i mean you know i not the best fit because you know cracking is a process that has a very large uh, distribution in onset times but we do get a kind of a linear fit which we like to see and therefore i'm showing this to you now there are of course a few outliers uh, or maybe before I uh, talk about the outliers let me just tell you so then you know this linear fit here gives us a slope okay and from this slope uh, we put in all the right numbers so here h is the height of the sample a is the thickness of the the width of the crack and you know we know what the evaporation rate is and this lets us estimate a fracture energy of about a thousand joule per meter square which uh, seems to indicate that this is a highly ductile sample so when it cracks you know it tries to resist cracks for a really long time but then it deforms 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 and then eventually gives way okay now we get back to the outliers here these red points here which are completely outside our you know the the prediction that the toy the predictions of our toy model and these are the samples so this is a, a very well known phase diagram of laponite suspension which is the clay we are using here okay this is the reference so this is plotted i'll just take one more minute so this is plotted okay so this is the sodium chloride concentration which is again what we are using this is the clay concentration and these three samples and this this big area in the middle here this is the uh, part where you are forming a gel now the red points here these are really very very close to the phase boundary between the gel and the pneumatic uh, uh, you know the pneumatic like uh, the pneumatic gel like sample and this is when the sample is fresh so as the desiccation happens as the water evaporates these three samples they are thrown into this gel phase okay so you can't really use the poroelastic model anymore okay because you know it has you know the particles are kind of they self assemble in a completely different way okay so what we have shown here is that again this is another experiment is desiccation not pattern formation in the interfacial pattern sense that you know we've used clay aging as a control parameter to modify the sample cracking we show that the poroelastic models uh, kind of work as long as our sample is in that soft glassy state and this is the group as we are now thank you for your attention and i'm sorry i took a lot of time
Thank very nice talk and the images. I just had a, I was curious to know, uh, in your samples, when as they are drying, is there, how would the patterns look if you had, if you take those drying, different stages of drying, hmm. and then inject this oil? And the reason I'm asking is, in this environmental sciences, there's a lot mm -hmm. of interest in contaminant fate and transport, right. as to how these um, oils, yeah. they, they, they transport into from soil to right. this as a... Uh, thank you. I mean, that's a great suggestion. Actually, we'll do it right after I go back. As the soil yeah. is actually um, um, desiccating or mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. losing, mm -hmm. how does the oil actually come up? Because that fate okay. and transport seems to be a very uh, okay. thing that... The, so I'm just okay. curious because you have, you're sitting on all these samples. Yes, yes. If that's an easy sample. So yesterday we heard a talk where there was a brittle fracture that was propagating yes. and then, you know, just putting a little bit of water, yes. you know, lubricates the whole thing and completely changes the crack. So thank you so for you know the little of, nudge. Uh, we'll do that as a function of percentage of sure, hydration. Yeah. How we can do these that. patterns? I, I think that I, I'm very. That's an easy experiment, but a very interesting yeah. one, as in all soft matter experiments. Thank you. Other questions? So Runjini, thank you for a very beautiful talk. Um, my question was that, uh, see, you are taking the first appearance of crack as the time when the substrate is exposed. Mm. However, I would I would assume that it certainly depends on the height. And yes. as you, as yes. you, yeah, so instead, uh, it's just a suggestion, think mm. of it, that when you write TC as proportional to, you know, you put everything else in a first bracket and put mm. one by root E, right. which you measured. So that's fine. But uh, I think maybe uh, it is right to include each in yes. that other thing because there is a lot okay. of work on uh, you know of course the height is uh, definitely a parameter right. because if you started with just when the crack appears mm. that is certainly mm -hmm. has got nothing because mm. cracks are propagating from top to bottom mm. right so uh, I mean that's one suggestion. Yeah, so I can actually you're completely right yeah. and like I said this is still very half-baked uh, no, okay we'll probably also more... look at different heights but no so see the thing is you know look at the time over which it dries I know, I know. you see so yeah but I, I agree that would be a much more careful to experiment. at least put height right. into your E factor we could do because that, that right. is a very important right. uh, factor which will determine your right. TC right so that I is agree and for that we need more heights which we are doing e now yes yeah so, yeah that's yeah. number one Right. Number two, uh, did you uh, particularly see, apart from putting NACL, which mm. is uh, changing your uh, mm. entire thing into mm. this, mm. so um, uh, I mean, did you uh, do any kind of same to see how the uh, particles, you know, uh, the laponite uh, aggregates have arranged themselves because of the effect of NACL as, as a test experiment without right. that? No, we did that. Yes. So we did same. Okay. Uh -huh. And did you uh, see the effect of NACL in any way changing the uh, aggregation? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh -huh. So that picture that I showed you at the beginning, that's with a lot of NACL and after waiting for a very long time. So you do see that. You know, so I don't have all the data here, but I can show you they're there on my computer. But yes, you know, you do form much more, uh, you know, less compact. Uh, the concentration of the clay could be the same, but and you do form gels. Okay, mm -hmm. because clay, you know, given the charge, you know, the distribution, you know, the the charge anisotropy, if you wait long enough, they do form gels. But if yes, you yes. don't put any salt at all, then you do see, uh, you know, a much more sparse network than you would if you put a gel, uh, than if you put a salt. So a network with salt, for instance, it will also have lots of flocculated clay particles. No, but that would also depend upon the weight percentage of any, uh, Absolutely. of, of, uh, of laponite itself. Right, but we, ha we are really, you know, the weight percentage that we have, we are working within a very, very narrow range. Regime. What was yeah. your weight percentage of so laponite? the soft glassy suspension? So we started Less than with 1%. a soft glassy suspension, yeah. So that you know, it kind of you know, so 1.75 would be a low estimate, but that that it's really between 2 and 3.75 percent yeah, yeah. weight by volume. So the wiggle room that we have is very, very limited. Very so you know, we can really change things by using additives. I'm almost done. I know the clock is five minutes uh, slow, uh -huh. uh, fast, sorry. So yeah, so we can put uh, salt and you can actually see you have the same amount of uh, clay, you have the same age of the clay, but then you know, you get much more dense networks when you use salt. And finally, can I ask just one more question? Yeah, are we gone? Okay. 
Yeah. So, uh, uh, any CL? Can you just say why it should be circular? Because uh, circu uh, the effect of adding any CL, I was clearly seeing that you had, you know, first the circular crack was forming, the mm. primary crack, mm. apart from uh, coming away from. Mm -hmm. So, you have any explanation for that? Uh, not right now. Okay. Not right now. But that is something we see. You know, I mean, I know, it's, I it's just something. You know, I haven't really wrapped my head around. We, right. it's all. It happened over the last, I think, couple of weeks or so. Thank so, thank <laughs> okay, you. thank you for your questions. Hi, thank you very much. Super interesting. Um, I was wondering, in the so in the very first part, uh, when you showed uh, uh, this this transition from this type of uh, more uh, compact, uh, dense viscous patterns to the uh, thin hmm. thin ones. Oh, so, so that that was with a missable. Come back. It was with a miscible fluid, right? So water entering the, the laponite, right? Yeah, up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, can you please repeat? I was. Uh, yeah, okay, so in, in the in the top uh, uh, right. row there. So th all of those are with the miscible fluids, right? Right. So do you see uh, in the time scale of the experiment actual mixing? Uh, so like the water changing the rheology of the defending phase. Uh, we have stopped just before that. Okay. You know, there you do see some dye kind of, you know, dissolving, but then, you know, because the, uh, because the spatial uh, details of the, you know, so, so once that mixing stops, uh, starts, we just stop the experiment and that's what we are calling the fully developed morphology. Mm. Yeah. The Peclet numbers are very high here. Right. So, okay. Super, thank you. Thank you.